Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Liz Bothwell from Waste 360 with Joshua Baca. He's vice president of the Plastics Division of the American Chemistry Council. Welcome, Joshua, and thanks for being on the show today. Liz, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with you. So we normally start in the beginning. Could you share a little bit about your background and how you ended up at the American Chemistry Council? Yeah, I'm happy to. And I, it's, you know, my background is different and unique probably than most people you speak to on this podcast. I, I did not have a career that began working with plastic manufacturers or the plastics industry. Um, I got a break when I was about 20 years old. I got an internship to come to DC to work on Capitol Hill and I never left. So my career really started in government and politics. I worked on uh, Capitol Hill for about five years, I guess, or so. Started off working as an intern, eventually made my way up the chain, started doing some of the policy work, and I, it was a great experience. Working on Capitol Hill was, you know, being able to be governing and functioning and, and work in the halls of Congress was definitely quite a unique experience. But what I quickly realized was I was never much of the policy, you know, wonk that kind of comes with Capitol Hill. And I also think that Policymaking on Capitol Hill has changed so dramatically since I was there. And I decided to take a different route and got more into the political space, um, working for the member of Congress at the time on her reelection campaign and then unsuccessful run for the U.S. Senate. And then I kind of moved into the, to the public affairs uh, communications consulting world before I joined uh, now Senator Romney's presidential campaign in 2012. Um, in that capacity, I worked. Um, um, across the U.S. on our political team, uh, largely on coalition building and um, bringing together a variety of stakeholders um, in diverse geographies and diverse backgrounds on a variety of different policy and communication initiatives on, on behalf of the campaign. Um, obviously, that campaign was not successful, and I went back into the public affairs space, and, you know, I think the time after working for Governor Romney's campaign were probably the most formulative of my career, just in the sense that working a presidential campaign, it changes your life and the kind of career direct, uh, trajectory I was on, the networks you make, the people you, you come in contact with, the mentors that you, you know, um, find along the way that you didn't really think of as a mentor at the time when you look back on them, you know, really transformed my career on so many levels. And, um, I stayed in the. I went back to the communication, the consulting business for uh, several more years. Had a really successful run, largely working with uh, brand companies and retailers um, on a variety of issues on taxes and trade and regulation uh, and a whole host of other issues. It, it was such a, a great experience that I, I look very fondly upon that. And then. Um, you know, I took a kind of a, a different route, and uh, several years ago, I joined the American Beverage Association, where um, I didn't even come in with the mindset of working on issues of sustainability. I came in largely uh, to help guide their public affairs and their communications, and came in at a time when they were preparing to launch a sustainability initiative uh, around plastic issues and plastic waste. And long story short, we launched a a hundred billion dollar uh, initiative called Every Bottle Back. And it was sort of through that process that I kind of became an expert in some regards to plastic issues by default. One, largely because, um, you know, the in-house expertise was relatively limited. And so you had to kind of get up to speed on these issues really fast and understand a lot of the dynamics that are complicated. And I would admit today that I'm not even the deepest expert when it comes to some of this stuff. Um, but I really cut, kind of cut my teeth in that uh, piece, and it was a great experience. And then, you know, to kind of put a bow on it, you know, opportunity presented itself to join uh, the American Chemistry Council. And uh, here I am almost a year later leading the plastics division, and um, it's been such a great experience as well, and one that I've really thoroughly enjoyed. 
Wow, what an interesting journey. And it, all those pieces seem to fit together, even though you didn't realize it at the time. Yeah, it, it really did. And, you know, if you even go back a little bit further in my life, you know, if I really kind of think about the lucky break I got in my career, and it was really not a, my career at the moment, but uh, when I was 16 years old, I applied to be a United States Senate page for my hometown senator. Um, and, you know, never had an intention of actually getting that paid ship. And, you know, lo and behold, um, I got that paid ship and I came to Washington, D.C. as a 16-year-old um, to serve as a Senate page for an entire spring semester. And so uh, it really kind of was in that moment when I kind of think back at it that, you know, it was my initial sort of run into government and politics. And then eventually coming back, you know, five, six years later um, as an intern and then staying out as a staff member you know, all of those things really tie together. It's funny because one individual who was one of the um, uh, my mentors at the time, he worked in the cloakroom when I was a Senate page, you know, now works for, um, you know, another, uh, I guess it's another association or another firm. And, you know, we've still run into each other. He's about maybe 10 years older than me. And, um, you know, we still remain in contact. And it's, it's a really small world on how all of these things kind of come together. And amazing that you had the wherewithal to go in that direction at such a young age. That's amazing. I would say I wish I could tell you, and I, you know, I'll definitely tell my kids a different story that I you know, had it all thought out. <laughs> it was, most of it, I would say, was really by accident. The page thing was not anything I ever really seriously considered when I did it. Um, and then I got it, you know, and then the next thing I knew was like six weeks later, I had to move to Washington. And same thing when I got the internship. I was having a great time in college, and I was working as an ambassador with the president's office and, you know, doing a lot of stuff on campus and, you know, helping recruit students. And, you know, lo and behold, I get a scholarship to come for an entire semester to um, work in D.C. as an intern, again, almost by accident, you know. And, you know, those things, I, I look back on them, and I, I do remember the effort I put into getting them, but it was never one of those things where, like, you know, I was like – losing sleep at night that I needed to get these things, that they were going to define my life in some ways. And in many ways, in retrospect, they really did. Awesome. Well, that what a great story. I'd love to hear that. And now you're at American Chemistry Council. Can you tell me more about what, what that organization does and your work in it? Yeah, you know, it's a great, it's a great question. And I, I'm happy you ask it because I don't even think for – I came here that I fully appreciated the depth and the breadth of the American Chemistry Council. I think that in in the Washington speak, there are a lot of associations for a lot of things. And there are associations, I think, who exist because, you know, they have whatever their mission and purpose is, and then there's others that exist to, you know, and you know, do big things is how I would say it. And I've worked with a variety of associations, particularly in my consulting world. And I think that the ACC falls into the ladder of wanting to do big things. And that was really attractive to me when um, I got recruited for the job. Um, our industry represents the chemical um, manufacturers across the U.S. It's like a $500 billion plus industry. Um, and ACC itself is a massive organization that focuses on a variety of different issues uh, within that space. Um, I lead the division that focuses on the uh, chemical manufacturers who make plastic resin. Um, we have a, our entire division is almost, you know, a simple way to think about it is almost an association within an association. So we have an equivalent of our own board, our members, our own budgets, our own dues. Um, and we have a, a, a committee that sets our priorities just as any board of directors would for any association. And our job in the plastics division is to lead uh, on issues of advocacy through collaboration and innovation is really what our mission is. Um, we have a variety of areas that we focus in on, sustainability and circularity obviously being uh, front and center here. And you know, I think when I view what my job is at the ACC in particular, is one is being an ardent advocate for our member companies and the great work that they're doing. Um, two is making sure that we lead with solutions to some really big problems and challenges that the world faces. Um, and three, um, that we're at the forefront of defining what these solutions are and what are our, what's our vision and what's our mission um, to solving some of these world challenges. Um, and I really take that to be a serious obligation in my job 
And those three things on a daily basis really do drive me. We got great companies. They do some really fantastic and innovative work. Um, companies that folks might not have ever, ever heard of, you know, um, you know, people are probably, you know, aware of companies like Dow and, you know, Exxon Mobil and maybe even Lion Dow Basel, but there is a whole host of other companies, Eastman, um, CP Cam, um, you know, Salonies, you know, big companies that do really, really innovative stuff and are really at the forefront of leading on this, you know, new era of innovation and in manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, and it's a really exciting time, uh, to be honest with you, for the industry right now, both in regards to, you know, our long-term vision on where we want to go, but also just in the immediacy of, of the challenges that are presented before us in our work to try to solve some. Definitely. And I, I'd love to hear how clear your mission is and how that guides you every day. And like you said, the current state of everything. And as you know, plastics is really on the world's radar now more than it has ever been. What do you think about this additional attention being paid to plastics? Look, I think it's a very important issue. And I think our company and our industry would be the first to admit that we do have a plastic waste challenge. That does not necessarily mean that we have a plastic problem. And I think our company and, you know, me in particular, divert all of our energies almost on a daily basis to implement solutions to deal with the issue of plastic waste. It's a solvable issue. It's an, an issue that um, requires a tremendous amount of collaboration, and no one industry alone is going to be able to solve it. Um, I think that issue of collaboration is one that's really critical. We have a role to play in it. Government has a role to play in it. Um, waste management companies have a role to play in it. Consumer brands have a role to play in it. Um, you know, um, consumers have a role to play in it. Um, the plastics value chain has a role to play in it. And I think we view our job of trying to bring all of those diverse stakeholders together to develop practical and real world solutions to some of these challenges. And I think that's where our focus is. We should absolutely be appalled by the plastic waste issues that have happened and they have been seen, but it's a solvable problem, one that we're making a tremendous amount of progress on uh, and one that we're very committed to working on as well. That's great to hear. And then, so what are your thoughts on the current state of recycling in our country? Well, I would think it, there's definitely room for improvement here. You know, mm -hmm. we have recycling systems that probably were designed, you know, several decades ago um, that, you know, we live in an entirely different world, both in how we consume um, goods and, and how the world operates. You know, so I, first off, I think, you know, the recycle, recycling is it broken? It needs improvements and it needs to be modernized to reflect the 21st century economy that we live in. So I think sometimes um, critics of, of recycling and even critics of our industry will point to that the problem can't be solved because recycling is broken. And recycling is a component of solving the problem, but it's not the only component here. Um, so I think with some improvements to the way our recycling system works would be a very positive first step. I can give you a few examples right now. There are, you know, 9,000 recycling jurisdictions across the U.S. that do 9,000 different things today. Um, I live in uh, Fairfax County in Alexandria, you know, and I, I sometimes can't even keep up with the changing uh, dynamics that happen here. I think our latest, if I remember correctly now, glass bottles aren't allowed to go in our recycling bin. If I'm correct, my friends who live in Arlington County, which is a few miles from here, I believe they are able to now put glass bottles in their bin. And, you know, in an area like this, you know, Arlington and Alexandria, is, it's very interchangeable. You know, I could drive five minutes away and be in an entirely different county with entirely different friends. And what I put in the bin as a consumer might not be the same as what I'm allowed to put in my bin at home. And so some modest improvements on education, on standardization, on some minimum standards, I think would go a long way in making sure that the system works today uh, and works to uh, meet the demand that is faced for the 21st century. Um, I think the other thing, though, is when I say recycling isn't the only thing, uh, recycling is a means to the end. There's a variety of other things that we need to do. Our industry takes it very seriously on our design and making sure that the products we design are designed for recyclability. I think that's one. 
Um, two, I think we take very seriously the need um, to collaborate with uh, stakeholders to solve some of these problems. Recycling isn't simply limited to the uh, men and women who drive trucks up and down our neighborhood to collect them. I think it requires a tremendous amount of collaboration with a variety of stakeholders to achieve that. So uh, yeah, I think with some, some slight improvements here and, and some modernization, um, we would actually call on the government to help make this better and make the system work for what it needs to be today. Absolutely, and to your point, it, it takes all stakeholders too, and it's an infrastructure issue. There's a lot to really dig into there. So, um, so yeah. talk, to, talk to me about advanced recycling. What? Tell me more about that and what role you think that could play in improving uh, recycling as a whole in our country. Well, advanced recycling is a unique solution to dealing with plastic waste. And um, when I think of what the role advanced recycling is, it's going to revolutionize how we deal with our resources and how we solve one of the biggest pressing challenges that we have when it comes to plastic uh, waste. Advanced recycling is a, is a, is a, for plastics is another form of recycling, not to get too wonky, but what it basically does is it's a variety of te the, the term advanced recycling really covers a host of different technologies that different companies use. And at the very basic level, what this does is it breaks down plastic waste, particularly the hard to recycle plastic, your pouches, your bags, um, you know, the, the container that maybe your, some of your food came in, um, you know, things that are, are, aren't really sort of your jugs and your bottles that are uh, traditionally known to be recycled today. And it breaks it down to the molecular level, it creates a, fee a feedstock that our companies can use to make new plastic with less resources. Uh, and it really does create that infinite circular loop that we're trying um, to achieve here in the U.S. I think for your listeners, when you think about what advanced recycling is, it's really a remanufacturing of used plastics into new products. It isn't that different than what mechanical recycling does um, today. And, what I, and I think the best way for your listeners to think about this is it really picks up where mechanical recycling leads off. It's not either or. We're not in competition with mechanical recycling. Our companies are invested in both. And there is a role to solving this issue with both mechanical and um, advanced recycling. So um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the U.S. to scale up the work that advanced recycling and the promise that it has. But we're seeing that with a variety of our companies. You know. Um, you know, companies like Braven and Brightmark and uh, Agilex are doing some really cutting edge stuff when it comes to dealing with issues of plastic waste. Several of our companies are, have made really large commitments to using more recycled plastic uh, in, the, in the products that they, that they create and that they, in the material that they supply. Um, and so I think what advanced recycling does is it really helps us live up to the words that we're saying about our desire to create a more circular system for plastic by ensuring more types of plastic get recycled. That makes sense. And so Joshua, what do you what do you say to the folks who really don't support mechanical or advanced recycling for one reason or another? Do they need more education, more information? Well, I think it depends on who, who that is. You know, my, my first reaction would be is that, um, uh, you know, definitely more education here and more education in the sense that, um, you know, helping people understand the importance of recycling. It's not, again, recycling is not the end all be all to everything we do. There are a whole host of other components that need to go on here. Um, you know, scaling of technology, modern regulatory framework, collaboration, you know, a lot of the things I mentioned. Um, but recycling is the means to the end to get into that point. And so what I would say to people is if you're serious about um, protecting the environment, if you're serious about addressing a whole host of issues like climate change and plastic waste, um, our ability to, you know, utilize the resources that we have more efficiently, both through mechanical and advanced recycling, is something that I would highly encourage them to get on board with. And I read that about a dozen states have passed advanced recycling legislation. Do you think that's going to grow? And also, do you see any commonalities to note within the states who have actually adopted this? Yeah, I think that's going to continue to grow. And I think it's going to continue to grow because we are being very proactive and working with lawmakers across the country and helping them define and understand what advanced recycling is. Mm -hmm. And so us creating a uh, 
essentially creating a regulatory framework in the states uh, is to ensure that we could actually scale up the technology needed to um, capture and recycle more plastic waste, turn it into new products. So um, that's really the purpose of the state work that we've done. I do anticipate that more states will get on board. Um, and frankly, we'll also need action at the federal level, um, both in regards to what the EPA has set forth as their recycling goals for 2030. I think they want to increase it by 50%. Um, there will be limits to what mechanical recycling can do to get to that point. Mechanical recycling is part of the solution, and advanced recycling picks up to kind of close that gap there. So um, I do see uh, a movement here. Um, lawmakers are interested in solving problems, and I think the more states that act on creating this regulatory framework um, will eventually probably require federal action as well, too, to ensure that the role advanced recycling play is recognized as part of the solution. And we're talking a lot about circularity, and so what does a circular economy look like to you, and where does plastics fit into it? Well, a circular economy to me means that we are, you know, using our resources over and over again and using them in an efficient manner um, to reduce our, reduce our reliance on, you know, essentially raw materials here. When I think about the role that plastic plays, I think we have been clear what our goal is. By 2040, we want all of our plastic packaging to be reused, recycled, or recovered. Um, we outlined a forward-thinking roadmap that brings together a variety of stakeholders to collaborate. Uh, to get to that goal, we've outlined a set of guiding principles um, that you know really sort of sets the tone for the types of policies that will be needed to get there. Our companies have made well over $5 billion of investments to modernize both mechanical and implement advanced recycling technologies. And we as an industry are working on a host of policy solutions that deal with a variety of topics that will help us to achieve those goals. Uh, we need to use more recycled plastic in our packaging, and I think there's a role to ensure that, that policies are reflective of that. I think we are um, need to recognize that a producer responsibility model is going to be needed to ensure that funding um, of the infrastructure that's needed to achieve circularity happen, um, and all of these things have to happen through a level of collaboration here. So um, those are the things that we are working on and how we think we achieve um, you know, that circular economy that everyone talks about. But I think more importantly, what we need to do as an industry and what I, I encourage all of my colleagues and, you know, everyone who works at ACC is words like circularity and sustainability are great sounding words. Now it is our job to help people understand what these things actually mean. A circular system means that we are utilizing our resources better and keeping waste out of the environment. A sustainable economy means that our industry is playing a huge role in ensuring that we have a low carbon future that we want, that we are um, supplying the materials that's needed to lightweight vehicles or build the next generation of electric vehicle batteries, that we are um, using uh, plastic foam insulation to make our buildings and our homes more energy efficient, that we're using plastic packaging as a means to keep our food fresh and reduce waste that is a huge driver of climate change. So when I think of what those two things are, we can really get caught up in the industry jargon or the Washington DC talk. We need to do a better job um, collectively as an industry in explaining what these things mean to the average person. Because I think when we do, people will appreciate what we're trying to do and get on board uh, and support some of the things that we're advocating for. Absolutely. And that's where we are. And I think the industry as a whole, and I, I put you in that as well, it's, we've reached that tipping point, right? Where now it's time for action. Um, and that's the direction we all need to row in. So it's, it's good to hear um, that you believe that as well. It's absolutely a time for action. And um, I don't think it's no longer acceptable just to talk about what we want to do or what we or think we can do. We need to show action in what we're doing. And all of the work that we're working on in the plastics division is geared toward leadership and action. That's what our goal is. Um, we're trying to bring stakeholders together. We're trying to develop policies that address these issues. We're working with our companies on a variety of issues that don't require um, government, whether it's design or private sector investment or partnership. So yeah, I think we have an opportunity here where we have pressing challenges, whether it's plastic waste or the issue of climate. and um, 
we, we can't sort of sit around and talk about it anymore. Um, it's a time for action and it's time for industries and stakeholders to step up to the plate and do something. And I think that's what we're doing on a daily basis. Oh, that's great to hear. And are you seeing more brands um, using recycled content? And what do you think works in getting them to do that more? Is it the standards? Is it other things, their own ESG and sustainability goals? What do you think? Well, I think right now from what, well, there's two things I would say to this. First off, consumers are demanding that there is more recycled content or more recycled plastic in their in their material that they use, whether it's packaging or other stuff. So consumers, one, I think have been pretty clear on the need for that. Second thing is that a variety of consumer brands, I think well over 400, have already made commitments to use um, recycled content or, repli- or recycled plastic in their packaging or their containers, all by date certain. And um, I think our job is to ensure that through a host of things like the scaling of advanced recycling, um, in particular, that we can help brands meet those commitments. So um, that's already happening, and I think everyone has widespread agreement on the need for for that um, to happen. Now, is there a role for government to play when it comes to the use of this? Yes, I would say so. There's definitely an appropriate role here to ensure um, that there's appropriate accountability, appropriate oversight, uh, and, and that uh, you know companies who make investments to ensure that more recycled plastic is used in packaging, that they can see those investments through. Um, I think we are um, we have been working with our companies on some of these issues, and I think you'll see in the coming weeks and through the summer um, a lot more uh, proactive um, proposals on how to deal with some of these issues. That'll be interesting to watch. And so what, what do you think lies ahead around policy? I know you have quite the background. I would love to hear your thoughts because I know there's a lot happening out there, um, whether it's a, uh, a plastics pact or a global treaty and then sort of some of the smaller EPR things within each state. Would, where's it all headed? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I I would say a couple of things. Uh, There are a lot of stakeholders doing a variety of different things. There's a lot of policy issues that really could impact a variety of stakeholders. Um, You mentioned a couple here, and I'll kind of take them head on. You know, the U.S. Plastics Pact, you know, very much appreciate what they're working on and and their goals and their objectives. Um, They they have a mission and they have a purpose that they're trying to ensure that um, we keep waste out of the environment, that our resources are used more efficiently. We support all of that. Um, and so I think what we would say to the U.S. Plastics Pack is um, let's find opportunities for more collaboration to solve the waste challenges that exist. Um, and I think that should be the front and center issue that they're working on. And we stand ready to work with them on those issues. I think when it comes to issues like global treaties on plastic, I think that's a very, very problematic proposal. Um, People may not realize and think what this could mean for them, but I think global regulation of the production of modern plastic materials would be highly problematic for our economy and highly disruptive to supply chains, not just in the U.S., but across the world. We do support a global treaty that deals with the issue of solving the plastic waste problem. And that treaty should ensure that investments occur uh, to help countries build up the waste management capacity that they that they need to do. People are going to probably be shocked to hear us say that, but we do. And I will reiterate that we support a global agreement that deals with the issue of plastic waste. And that should be the focus of these efforts. Um, And so when I think about where we're headed over the long term, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that policy is going to continue to be front and center on how we deal with these issues. Um, There are a variety of proposals out there, some good, some bad, some that we support, some that we don't support. You mentioned the issue of uh, extended producer responsibility. Um, Not all types of uh, EPR systems are created the same. Um, There are EPR proposals at the state that have broad support from industry stakeholders and uh, a variety of key players that would need to make the system work. I would point to you, Maine. I testified there a few weeks ago in favor of a proposal that had broad bipartisan uh, collaborative industry support here. There are other proposals that uh, seek to implement uh, EPR systems that could adversely impact the, pack- the plastics industry and don't have a lot of support right now. And so what I, the reason I would raise that is 
I think there's going to be a moment here to address some of these issues from a public policy perspective. And I think the playbook has shown itself to be very clear what that entails. We saw last year a Republican president, a Democratic senator, and a, Democrat, and a Republican senator come together and uh, pass into law the Save Our Seas Act 2.0. Um, that is the template of bipartisanship to deal with these issues. Issues of plastic waste don't know boundaries. They don't know partisan politics. Issues of climate also don't know any of those boundaries. And so the key here is um, looking to build consensus, bringing people together on solutions that are practical and implementable, and ensuring that they are bipartisan uh, and have broad support to deal with these issues. There are very problematic proposals out there that um, Opponents will say that it's an issue to address the issue of plastic waste, but when you dive into the intent of their legislation and how it's written, um, it does actually very little to deal with plastic waste. So um, on the reverse of that, I think from a policy perspective, um, our companies are also very excited about opportunities that exist. Um, the president has outlined a very ambitious uh, infrastructure agenda. I'm talking about ushering in the next generation of mobility and making our buildings more energy efficient, um, you know, rebuilding infrastructure. Our companies will play a huge role in helping us achieve that, that vision. Plastic as a whole is a net positive for the environment. It helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's better for the climate than any other material out there. That's why automakers use it to lightweight their vehicles. That's why the building construction use, utilizes it to uh, insulate our homes and our buildings. And so we'll play a very key role in helping implement that vision um, that the president has outlined and I know both parties are working to address in Congress. So um, I like to think about the future as being very bright when it comes to policy. I think it's very bright in the sense that um, we know that collaboration can deal with the issue of climate and we know that collaboration can deal with the issue of plastic waste. Uh, and it is that model that I think we're going to divert our energies to ensure that that happens. That makes sense. And uh, it's what you said about some of the unintended consequences of, of some of the policies that are out there that people might not understand and how it will affect uh, the supply chain going forward. I, you're right. It's plastics is often made the enemy, right? It's the villain, but you have to look at what good it has done in the world and how hard it would be to actually take out of the system, right? I mean, I've spoken to so many people who have uh, worked on uh, pl removing plastics from, you know, the ocean-bound plastics out of developing nations, and they have to use certain plastics there. It's all that they can afford, right? So there's one piece of that, and the waste pickers over there, it is their, their future. Um, it, from an economic standpoint, so that those kinds of things have to be taken into account before plastics is really looked at as the villain. And I think, like you said, you can do both. You can still fight against plastic waste and ocean-bound waste, and while also knowing the good that it can do. So that was a great description. Thank you for that. Yeah, and look, I'll give you another even real-world example. Think about the last year of what we've been through in the last year. You know, our life has been turned completely upside down. Um, we had to change our behaviors. Government asked us to make a tremendous amount of sacrifices. And if we think about the role that plastics played in helping us get through the pandemic, it might not even be recognizable to some people. The masks that we were required to wear were made from plastic material. The vaccines were transported uh, in polystyrene foam coolers to ensure that they were uh, remained cold as required. Um, the syringes to give those vaccines happen all the takeout food that we ordered to help local restaurants came in, pla in plastic packaging. Um, I think you know, several government agencies said that plastic packaging was one of the safest ways to avoid the transmission of you know, germs and a variety of other things and protect our food and keep our people safe. You know, I traveled across the U.S. for the first time in, um, I guess it was late March and early April. We, uh, my wife, my daughter, and I, we took a trip to California. My brother-in-law retired from the Navy. And then we had the, the best part about it is we stopped in New Mexico to see my mom for the first time in almost 15, 16 months. It's been a while. And, you know, that whole trip was just such, you know, mind, it was so mind blowing to me on so many ways. You know, we had, you know, having a three-year-old toddler and having to prepare for that trip is already, a, you know, just a, a cluster in so many ways. Mm -hmm. The sanitizer that we carried on the plane was in a plastic bottle. 
The water that we bought at the airport to fill up our, our containers was in a plastic bottle. All of my daughter's food and snacks was in plastic packaging. Um, the material that they gave us on the plane to um, you know, wipe up and dispose of our, our areas, all made of plastic material. Um, and so you know, it's, it was very telling to me that we don't need people to give us a pat on the back that these things make their life better. Uh, but I think it is important for stakeholders who advocate for adverse policies without understanding what those uh, unintended consequences are, understand what these things really mean. And that's why I say, uh, and I'm very deliberate in my words, we need real world practical solutions to deal with these issues. Definitely, and collaboration is key as always. So what are you and ACC paying attention to now um, beyond what we've already talked about? What's, what's next, what's on the horizon? Well, that's a good question. You know, I mean, there's a lot on the horizon. I mean, the challenges that we face um, and the opportunities that exist at the state, the federal, and global level, I think, will continue. Um, I think most of our energies will continue to be focused there. Uh, um, you know, we view our mission in, an, I would say, somewhat of a narrow focus, but also on a very important focus. Our association exists to advocate for our member companies. And when I think about advocacy, that means policy, that means communication, that means brand reputation. That's what we do on a daily basis. So um, the political environment can come and go and shift and parties will gain power and change and there will be new priorities that will emerge as things happen in the 24-7 you know, news cycle. That's where our laser focus will continue to be, uh, is ensuring that we advocate on behalf of our industry, um, that people understand the story behind it, that we support policies that make a difference and implement solutions, um, and that um, you know we're there having a seat at the table to ensure that we shape what the future looks like. That's great. It's so clear. I love that. And everything you have shared has been so clear and uh, descriptive. So thank you for that. Is there anything else you want to share before I let you go? Um, I would say this, and I think this is a really important sort of thing. Um, for your listeners out there who might have impressions or maybe don't have impressions about what our industry is, um, I would highly encourage you to spend some time and, and appreciate the value and the work that we're trying to do in both making our lives better, but also solving some really big global issues. We got a great website called americasplasticmakers.com that outlines some of the things that we're working on and some of the solutions. Um, talk is cheap. I could sit here and talk to you all day about how great our companies are. I encourage your listeners to go on that website and see some of the real world commitments and solutions that our industry is doing to solve both issues of, of climate and issues of plastic waste. That's awesome. And I can't wait to, to see where else you go. And they have a great leader in place. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I've enjoyed talking to you. I got to say, I, I, my time at ACC feels like I've been here, you know, nine years. Um, and I've only been here not even a year. I think I'm going on nine months. Uh, but I have been just blown away by uh, the level of engagement from our companies, um, their desire to solve problems. Um, their desire to collaborate, you know, these are, when you're in my type of role, these are the types of things that you always want an industry to be uh, doing. And so we are, um, we're, I'm pretty excited about where the future lies for this industry and for our association and for our division. And I would encourage you to kind of stay tuned in because I think you'll see some more big things happening over the next couple of months. Oh, that's awesome. And the momentum's definitely heading in the right direction. So it's exciting to watch. Yep. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you to your listeners for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. And if I could ever be of help, please let me know. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you okay. so much. Have a great day. Bye, Joshua. Yeah. Thank you for listening. It would mean the world if you would take a moment to rate or review this podcast. And if you share it with us, on one of our social networks, we are giving out some fun, nothing wasted podcast swag. So just tag us and see what you get. Thanks so much.